Wouldn't it be good when we get to heaven if we could play the organ like that? Wouldn't that be good? Gunner, you better watch out, buddy, when we get there. <laughs> what a good morning already. Uh, it's so good to be together in the house of the Lord on such a beautiful morning. And how quickly the summer is going. Isn't it amazing how time is flying so fast? But there's still time. If you haven't registered your kids for K-Kids, you still have time, although it's filling up almost full now. So if you haven't done that, make sure you get your kids registered for that. Uh, we had the administrative council meeting recently, and we recorded uh, the, as much of it as we could. And that should be out this week, we think, on, uh, on our website. So if you uh, haven't heard or seen what happened in the administrative council meeting, you can watch that and, and be fully up to speed on that. You did a really good job last week with your communication card. Remember those things? Will you take those out and wave those to me again so I know you have it? You did a great job uh, filling those out last week. Thank you for doing that. If you would do that again, in fact, I'm going to tell you, you did better than 11 o'clock did, so I'm going to challenge them to step up this week. So thank you for doing that. Let us know how we can pray for you, and uh, we would love to do that. I want to pray for us, and I'll invite you to stand and greet those around you. Uh, Father, it is so good to be in your house and to come in uh, filled with uh, the beautiful music that Gunnar just shared with us, which ushers us into your presence this morning, that, that you, above all others, should be lifted up, should be glorified and praised this morning because you're worthy. So, Lord, we praise you and we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now stand and greet those around you, if you would.
walk worthy of the Lord. We're talking about how God is worthy this morning. Gunner's ready to play that hymn, so we're going <laughs> to... We're going to let her get on with the, the first hymn. We're singing, Crown Him with Many Crowns. And you know, the Crown Him with Many Crowns never has the word worthy in it, but it sure talks about everything but the word worthy. It says he's the lamb upon his throne. One of our Camp Do Re Mi songs this morning, uh, this week, the motion was, He's on his holy throne, and we made a chair as we were sitting on God's holy throne. So let's stand and lift our voices as we sing, crown him with many crowns. Join me, please, in our affirmation of faith that comes from Deuteronomy 10. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and Lord of lords. He is the great God, the mighty and awesome God, who shows no partiality and cannot be bribed. He ensures that orphans and widows receive justice. He shows love to the foreigners living among you and gives them food and clothing. So you too must show love to foreigners, for you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. You must fear the Lord your God and worship him and cling to him. Your oaths must be in his name alone. He alone is your God, the only one who is worthy of your praise, the one who has done these mighty miracles that you have seen with your own eyes.
taking a peek up here at the flowers do. They are beautiful. They are given in memory of Teresa Menchu by Gary, her husband and family, and they are absolutely stunning. So thank you, Gary, for sharing those with us this morning. If you'll bow your heads, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we know you. We are so thankful that we have a love that we can share with others because of the love that you have shared with us. We are so thankful this morning, Lord, that you are greater than anything we could ever imagine and that you are for us, that you are for us. Lord, no matter how the world around us looks, we can have hope this morning, we can have peace this morning because we know that the God of all creation is for us. Lord, we ask as we come into worship this morning that you would calm our hearts or that you would still our minds. God, in these moments, we take a second to stop and just offer up to you the things that are heavy on our hearts today, Lord. God, we ask that you would give us faith to remember and to believe, or that in you all things are possible, that we are not bound by circumstances because of you, or you change everything. Just your presence changes everything. And so, God, we thank you for that this morning. Lord, we ask that you would forgive us for the times that we Maybe let that slip our minds and we start to live our lives in our own power. And God, we keep going as long as things keep being good. But Lord, then they start to fall apart and we come running back. And God, we're so thankful that you're always there to receive us. But oh God, would you forgive us? Would you teach us to not ever get to that point? To not leave that certainty and assurance and that resting in your power or to not take up our life in our own hands but God to constantly be surrendering it back to you God we ask that as this morning we are reminded that COVID is not gone God we have had a break and for that we are thankful we have been able to rest and to regroup and and Lord, make some major strides forward in it. But Lord, it's not done yet. So we need you to continue giving wisdom and power and knowledge to doctors and nurses and researchers. Lord, we ask that you would be with those who are suffering right now as COVID numbers continue to climb. Lord, that you would be with all of those who are sick, be with their families. God, I pray that you would once again uh, calm this virus down or that we might uh, continue to live even more fully in you and in this world. Lord, we thank you for everything that you have done so far. Lord, we have absolute faith and hope that you will continue to guide us through every situation. Lord, we pray for the church this morning. Or the big church, the United Methodist Church, the church bigger than the United Methodist Church, and also for our little church right here on the corner of Park and Patterson. God, we pray that you would help all of us to be seeking the face of God. Lord, in all that we do, that we would, would be drawn to stand on the word of God, to stand on the truth of who you are, because there is no other place to stand that is safe but in your word. And so, Lord, that's our prayer this morning, that you would guide our leadership. Lord, guide the leadership of this country, of this town. Lord, we pray that your spirit 
would continue to move them, to speak to them, to guide them. Lord, give us hearts that are uh, seeking to be obedient to the things that you call us to and to the leadership that you place over us. Lord, we, again, are so thankful. We're so thankful that we worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who is worthy. Lord, I pray today as we join our voices together <clears throat> that this would not just be words that we say, but God, we would uh, speak them from our heart, from our soul, to the one, the only one, who is worthy to hear them. Lord, hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We just want to take a quick second. Thank y'all again for being an amazing church. Camp Do Re Me last week was fantastic. And it's because of you. It's because of what you give. The other thing I just want to reiterate is what Jimmy said about your communication card. I, we look at those every week. I work in those every week. And I love to get to love y'all. And those little slips are more important than you can imagine. So please fill them out. Help us out. You can drop them in the plates as you exit. Uh, you can drop your offering there as well, or you can give by one of the ways on the slide. And Children's Church, today, if y'all want to meet Miss Lynn, right over here.
it's hard to follow that. But you know, I, we're, we're closing out this series today, the one story, his story. And, and we've learned, I hope, over these last now seven weeks, we've learned about his story, that, that it started outside of time, his story, and, and it runs through all of time, including our little piece of it. I've shared with you these, uh, I call them graphs, I'm not sure what we call them, but the, the his story one of, of God's story just moving across all of eternity. And maybe you'll remember these graphs after we leave this series because we, we've discovered that the Old Testament stories point to the New Testament stories and, it, and it's all one big story with one message. It all points to Jesus. And it reflects that that's God's story from the beginning. And somewhere along the way, we've discovered also that, that you and I have a story as well. And our story moves across our timeline. And it has peaks and valleys, just like all stories do. And we've been considering how is it that my story fits in some way with God's story, because obviously they have to. And what we've discovered, if, if we've been honest with ourselves, we've discovered that there are times when our stories just intersect with God's. It's like for the moment we're together and we're experiencing the divine from above that is moving through our life in the moment. But then we go about our regular life, just like the Israelites did in the Old Testament. And so we have these intersecting moments, and they're good moments. But, but what we've realized I hope is that our story shouldn't be a story of intersection with God's story it should be one story inside of his story so that our blue line is buried up inside of God's story his line moving across our lives and it's been for me it's been an encouragement as we've discovered where we fit in this story and so today we wrap it up I don't really want to. I'd love to continue it. But I thought if we're going to close this out, we need to do so with, with simply uh, one word. And that word is worthy. Worthy. I, I don't know if you know what that word means, but, but the definition of it, uh, I found three, three definitions that I like. The first one was this. It's having worth or value in the uh, Bible, it, it's referring to weightiness. It's, it's something having weight, and that makes it valuable. Uh, the, the second one was this. It's pretty clear. It's deserving of honor, that, that whatever this is that is worthy, it deserves our honor. And the third one I really like, too, and that's value measured by the qualities or by the esteem ascribed to the item or person. The value measured by the qualities of who God is, who Jesus is, and the esteem that he deserves. And so we're, we're thinking about worthiness. And the image that I love so much in the Bible uh, about worthiness comes from the book of Revelation. I don't spend a lot of time, I'll tell you honestly, in, in Revelation. Maybe, maybe you don't either, or maybe you do. But, but when I do, I'm always moved by this particular image of heaven and what happens there to, to reveal the end of the story, the story. And, and today we want to spend a moment looking at this image of worthiness. It's an image of Jesus Christ. So our scripture today comes, just a piece of it comes from Revelation 5, verses 11 through 13. I'll invite you, please, to stand as we honor God's word. And let's read this together out loud. Then I looked again, and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne, and of the living beings and the elders, and they sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who is slaughtered, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. They sang, blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated.
there, there's, there's only one who is worthy. There's only one, and he is Jesus Christ. He's the one who is worthy. And, and I wondered, so what is it that makes him so worthy uh, as we just understood that definition? Uh, he's worthy for a number of reasons. And the first is this, that he is worthy because of who he is, simply because he's Jesus. He's worthy. He's worthy because he and the Father are one and the same. Christ tells us that in the New Testament. The Father and I are one, and he wanted us to be united with him so that we would be one with him and the Father. And, and Moses in the Old Testament knew the Lord, and he knew that the Lord was worthy. It was uh, in the passage that we share together uh, for our confession of faith today, the affirmation of our faith in Deuteronomy 10. And, and I want to highlight there verse, verse 21, you'll see. It says that he alone is your God, the only one who is worthy of your praise, the one who has done these mighty miracles that you have seen with your own eyes. He's the one, the only one who is worthy. Christ is worthy because of who he is. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He's the Prince of peace. He's the Savior King, the, the righteous judge of the world. He is perfectly filled with God the Spirit. He is completely loved by God the Father. He is the only man who has defeated sin. He is the light of the world. He is the hope of all the nations. He is worthy simply because of who he is. But he's also worthy because of what he did. In Revelation, there's, that we read a piece of just a moment ago, there, there's the image of what happens in heaven at some point. This image given to John who wrote the, the uh, book of Revelation. And, and there's this, this story that is unfolding there in heaven. And it has to do with a, with a scroll that has seven seals on it. I don't know if you can see the image that, that Victoria drew for us or not, but there's the throne, and in the seat is the, is the scroll, and it's got seven seals on it. it and, and the question is, this, this scroll that has seven seals is, who can open it? Who, who is it that can break the seals and, and read the story? And the story that is written there, as we understand it, it is the, it's a heavenly book containing God's plan and the destiny of the world. It's the, the final piece of it. And, and we'll, we'll see in a little bit that there's, there's this sense there in heaven as John is witnessing this vision that God had given him that there's no one that is worthy to open the scroll. And they ask the question, who is it? Who's worthy? And, and look at the answer. It comes in Revelation 5, verse 3. It says this, But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. No one. No one. Here's what it means. That means that Buddha could not read this scroll. It means that Socrates couldn't open the scroll. It means that Confucius couldn't do it. It means that Mother Teresa couldn't do it. There's only one who could do it. And we'll see the one that's described there is the lamb who had been slaughtered. He's worthy because of what he did. Theologian professor Dr. David Watson says this when we use that phrase, worthy of Jesus. It says this, he says this, only Jesus is truly worthy. So when we use this biblical description of Jesus, we're pledging our allegiance to him. And doing so in a way that puts allegiance above all other allegiances we have. Allegiances to nations, political parties, friends, family. All of these are subordinate 
to our allegiance to Jesus. He is worthy and worthy above all others. Paul gives us a beautiful image in the New Testament of Christ's worthiness. It, it, we'll find it in, in Philippians chapter 2. It's, it, it's an early creed that has already developed at this point as people came to understand who Christ is based on what he did for us. And so Paul recites and writes down this creed for us. It's known as the kenosis. It's, it means emptying, that Jesus emptied himself of all of his uh, divinity, his powers as the divine God, so that he would limit himself as he came to earth. He was still fully human and fully divine, but he limited himself, emptied himself of that power, using that power. Philippians 2, 8 through 11 says this, Christ humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross. He's worthy. But, but then I ask the question, what, what is he worthy of? When it comes to us if we say that he's worthy then what's he worthy of from us and i made a list fill these blanks in jesus is worthy of my worship that's why it's important for us to gather together as the body of christ and worship because when we do we're saying to him you are worthy of our worship and we've come to give ourselves to you. Yes, we want to receive from you too, but we want to give because of what you've done and who you are. You're worthy of my worship. You're worthy of my praise. I praise you, Father, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. It, it is by my praise that, that I am able to, in some small measure, acknowledge what you've done by, by us and for us. And then he's worthy of my adoration. That is, that I, I should be so in love with him that, that he is the central focus of all of my life. I adore him for what he has done and for who he is. But it also means this, that he's, he's worthy of my devotion, that I'm devoted solely to him and, and no one else above him. Only Jesus Christ. He deserves my devotion and he deserves and is worthy of my obedience too, which means that I do what I know he wants me to do. Even when it hurts, I do it. And the last one I filled in is just a catch-all. He's worthy of everything, everything that I have, everything that I am, everything I would ever be. He's worthy. And then I thought, it's not just mine. I, I, you could substitute the word, he's worthy of all worship all praise all adoration and devotion and obedience and everything from everyone he's worthy of it Jesus is worthy but it also raised another critical question for me and maybe it will for you too and this is the second thought I had am I worthy of him are we worthy of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us and who he is you know, at first blush, my, my answer would be, your answer might be too, an emphatic no. There's no way I am. I remember um, e even just this morning as I was on my knees praying for today's services. And I was just overwhelmed as I was thinking of his worthiness and how unworthy I am of him. There's no way I'm worthy, right? John Piper says, being worthy of a gracious Savior includes a sense of unworthiness, similar to the confessions of the centurion and John the Baptist. You remember the centurion who asked that Christ would come and, and heal his servant? And, and he said, You're not, I'm not even worthy for you to come to my house. Just say the word and he will be healed. And then John the Baptist who says that he's unworthy even to untie the sandals of, the, of Christ. 
There's this sense of unworthiness, yet in the middle of it, somehow or another, because of the grace of God at work through Jesus Christ, he makes us worthy. Jesus makes me worthy, you worthy, because of what he did for us. And so the question then becomes, okay, well, what do I, what do, I do with that? How do I respond to that? Because of what he did, then we heard the choir sing in a beautiful way as we started that, that we, we live worthy, we walk worthy. We live a life that is worthy of him because of what he did. And, and that's clear from the scripture. Look at these passages. Over and again, we see in the New Testament, Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 1, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. He writes again in Philippians 1, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Colossians 1.10, he writes, Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 2.12, Walk in a manner worthy of God. And 2 Thessalonians 1.11 says this, God chose you. And we keep praying that God will make you worthy of being his people. We pray for God's power to help you do all the good things that you hope to do and that your faith makes you want to do. We're to live that life of worthiness. And, and even Jesus spoke to that as well. It's in Matthew 10, verse 38. You remember this passage. He said this, If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, then you are not worthy of being mine. In other words, if we're living our life like that intersecting line that we saw, are we worthy of being called his? Are we worthy? And so the, the question that I have to ask myself, and maybe you'll ask it as well, am I living my life in response to his worthiness? Is that the way I'm living my life? Because as we learned a couple of weeks ago, Jesus, you remember, spoke about nominal Christians that were a part of the Sardis church. That's also in Revelation. And in chapter 3, verse 1, we learned that he said this of those nominal Christians. He said, I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Remember that? But you are dead. In other words, you say that you're my follower. You carry the title, but you're not living a life worthy of me but he goes on as he's writing this letter to the church at Sardis he goes on to say that there were some who were walking in a worthy manner listen to this verse 4 yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil they will walk with me in white for they are worthy it's an interesting reference there to soiled clothes because it was a reference to the woolen industry in the city of Sardis. Th those with soiled garments that were living in that city were, were removed from the public list of citizens that were part of the city. If you had soiled clothes, your name was taken off of the roll as a citizen in that city. In the pagan religions, it was forbidden to approach gods in garments that were soiled or stained. You just couldn't do it. So soiling is the symbol for mingling with pagan practices and thus defiling the purity of one's relationship to Christ. And so I wonder, are we walking in a manner worthy of him or our Clothes sold. David Platt, a, a minister, preacher, teacher, and author, says, says this about this worthiness. He said, Jesus is clearly worthy, absolutely worthy of more than nominal adherence and church association. We must not reduce this Jesus to a poor, puny Savior who is just begging for people to accept him into their hearts as if Jesus needed to be accepted by us. He doesn't need your acceptance. He doesn't need my acceptance. He doesn't need any of our acceptance. He's infinitely worthy of all glory in the universe 
And he doesn't need us at all. We need him. We desperately need him. And it's true. It's absolutely true. And so I want to I wrap up this series in a little different way today. I want to read this passage from Revelation. And I want you to imagine being there in this moment when there's this scroll that cannot be opened by anyone. And the seven seals are binding it. And the, there, there's this anxiety and, and there's, there's this desire that somebody must come and open it. It's Revelation 5, 1 through 13. John writes, Then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. That's God, the Father. There was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals on the scroll and open it? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. Then I, this is John witnessing this, he says, Then I wept, then I began to weep bitterly because no one was found a worthy, worthy to open the scroll and read it. But one of the 24 elders said to me, Stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered. But it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the 24 elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which represent the sevenfold spirit of God that is sent out into every part of the earth. He stepped forward and took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they had gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song with these words, you are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God. And they will reign on the earth. Then I looked again and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne. And of the living beings and the elders. And they sang a mighty, in a mighty chorus. Worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength. And honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. And they sang blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne. And to the Lamb forever and ever.
stand, please. Of honor and glory, blessing and power are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Is anyone worthy? He is. Now may we go and live our lives in such a way that is worthy of him so that others might be drawn and know the truth that he alone is worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace. We love you all. See you next week.